For information on any of the animals that you see in this video today or on zoos, pop into your local library where you can find a variety of books available, either fiction or non-fiction. If you're not a member yet, you can sign up online or sign up in your local library where a member of staff will help you. Welcome to Hamwell Zoo. Um, we've been here for a long time now. We used to be known as Brent Lodge Park Animal Centre or even further back as Bunny Park. So the zoo in some form or another has been here for about 50 years now. We celebrated our 50th birthday two years ago. Um, so I'm Jim, I'm the manager down here. And over that 50 years it's really grown from a small collection of unwanted pets where it got its name of Bunny Park from, into a zoo. Uh, the biggest developments probably in the last four or five years is we've seen the addition of a group of Caribbean flamingos, which are our pride and joy. Later additions are like Nile and Anubis behind me. These were our miniature donkeys. But the zoo's grown really quickly in recent years. And this year, 2020, we got our first cat species in. So we've got a Marge, uh, which are native to South America. The R1 came from Wales, so Jack is 14 years old now, and he's basically come here as part of a European breeding program. Not only do we get a cat species in for the first time, we also set up a nocturnal house, and in there we've got some grey slender loris. So these are incredible animals, they're night monkeys. So the house has to be dark in the daytime to allow people to see it and then light at night. So we reverse our light cycle. And they again are part of a European breeding program. And we're really hoping that our pair will produce youngsters at some point. Other things that have happened, especially this year, we've moved the capybara onto the lake. So they've got a much bigger area to swim in. Hi. Uh, these are our Caribbean flamingos you can see behind us. So these came from Chester Zoo three years ago. So we, we have 11. They're a young flock. They're only four years old now. And it's been a really exciting time for us this year. Because this year, for the first time ever, they built massive nests. Unfortunately, we haven't had any eggs this year, but they are learning part of the breeding behavior. So, um, so we're hopeful next year, but now they've learned how to build the nest, we'll actually have some eggs next year. So we've got three males and eight females in the group, and the noises you can hear behind me are them constantly talking to one another. They're always squabbling for position, always keeping in touch with one another. The main question we get about the flamingos is how do they turn pink? So when these animals are born, they're sort of whitey grey sort of colour and the parents will regurgitate their food for the youngsters. Now as soon as they start getting the food from the parents, they start getting this beautiful pink coloration. And then when they're adults themselves, they get all that coloration from the dry food we give them. So they have a specialist food, a floating food, contains tiny crushed up shrimps and by eating those shrimps that gives them this pink coloration. The other most common question we get is how they can stand on one leg like they do. Their legs are capable of locking in position so that allows them to stay on one leg and they'll often relax when they're on that one leg. They won't fall into a deep sleep like we will. They will take a few seconds of rest time and they think the theory behind this is if they fall into a deep sleep they will lose their balance that will wake them up and they'll put their second foot down and this is a way of keeping themselves awake some animals will prey on these and a whole flock all falling asleep at one time be really vulnerable so what these animals do is they take very slight naps every now and then if they fall into a deep sleep they lose their balance and wake up So these are our five slender-tailed meerkats. We've got a group of four boys, all siblings, and one girl. They're a non-breeding group. 
um, because there's a lot of these in zoos at the moment, so ours are just kept for educational purposes. They are rain, the four boys are seven years old now, and the females get older at nine. These are some of the most charismatic animals we, we have at the zoo. They're, they're from Africa. Um, they, they live on the, in the savannah in big social groups. And you can see from the tube that's moving in front of them, enrichment's a really important part of what we do. So although they have a large area outside, we try and fill their spaces with as many things as we can. And these animals are naturally inquisitive, which is why they've become such a firm favourite with the public. So anything new, like the tube you can see in there, is explored a lot of the time. And much, much like us, they need to be mentally stimulated a lot, really just to keep their environment new and different. So these have been with us now for a, quite a while, um, and they're mixed with the porcupines, so the meerkats go out in the day, and the porcupines go out at night. We have mixed them at times, but the meerkats just went up, bothered the porcupine, who splayed up, the meerkats ran out. Then the meerkats forgot on what they'd done, ran back in about five minutes later, and they did exactly the same thing. So this just carried on throughout the day. So we now separate them, and they get on relatively well. And you can see from them what these animals are so adept at doing. The big dark area around their eyes acts a bit like sunglasses. So when they get the glare off the sun on the savannah, this helps to lessen the impact on their eyes. You'll also see they've got long sharp claws on them. And that's key for meerkats because they'll often dig uh, in, in the earth for bugs and termites, which are their main source of food. And you'll often see them on their back legs as well. These are a communal animal. And what they'll do is they'll often sit on their back legs looking out for threats. Most of their threats come from the sky. So they're often <laughs> up and looking to see what's up above to come down. They don't look particularly concerned at the minute. But you can see how much interaction they have with one another. And the group is a really strong, cohesive one in our case. And they do like to be around each other a lot of the time. Meerkats, like a lot of communal animals, it's the females that rear the root, rule the roost. So they're the dominant ones. The males will go in between groups, but it's the females that are really the main power source within most groups. Same with ours as well. It's the female that's dominant, and the four boys are really just there to uh, do whatever she tells them to. The animals you can see in front of you are, are crested porcupines and Hatari, the animal you can see in front that's just laying down there. He's really special to us as a collection and to me personally. So all the other animals in the zoo, they came from other zoos. So we're part of cooperative breeding programs where we will take surplus animals from other zoos and they will come here. Hatari is the only animal that came from a private collection. So about seven years ago now, Hatari was discovered being badly treated. He had been kept in a dog crate for, we think, up to six months, and he had a broken leg. Um, he, was, he was confiscated from the previous owner, and then he came to live with us. We only held him temporarily to start with. And when he first came in, Tari would pace and pace and pace up and down in his enclosure. Even though it was big enough for him, he was so used to the confines of his old dog crate that he couldn't stop this abhorrent behaviour. So at the time, we spent about two to three hours a day with him, trying to get him out of the routine of going up and back, up and back. And after about six or seven months, he started to calm down. But we noticed he would get very upset when we left him. So we then had to sort of wean him away from us as company. So after about a year of having Atari, when he'd really calmed down, we'd get upset when we left. 
we decided to introduce him to another porcupine. The one you might be able to see in the background is Kachumba. Now, before you introduce most animals, you, have, you let them see each other, but they can't get to one another. So we did this for two or three months with the Tari and Kachumba. And when we first introduced them, Hatari would run behind us for protection because Kachumba would be a bit more dominant. She was brought up with porcupines and Tari never really understood how to behave because he'd been taken away from his mum at such a young age. Eventually Tari started coming into his own and now they're together all the time. Um, they were moved into this this new facility seven years ago. This is the indoor area, and they go out at night. And then probably the happiest I've ever been in the zoo world. Four years ago, Atari and Kachumba produced a litter, and they are baby porcupets, which have now gone off to other zoos. But now we have very little to do with Atari because he's a porcupine again. He spends all his time with Kachumba, and you can see he's not worked up with us being in here, but most importantly, he doesn't get worked up when we leave either. And it's one of the nicest things I've done, really, seeing Atari come, come back to being a porcupine. When we first had him, his light cycle had been broken. Because he, they were doing shows with him, they wanted him to be active in the day. And so they kept him up all day so he would sleep at night. These animals are crepuscular, they're mainly active at dawn and dusk and we managed to get his light cycle back to what it should be and as you can see now he tends to do very little in the day which is what a porcupine should be doing and he's just active at night. But although he doesn't look like much, Atari's been through a lot and he's really settled down since he's been with us. Porcupines do really well in the wild, they're a type of rodent. Their main thing is they can chew through anything. They can even chew through concrete, as we found. Um, but out of all the animals we have, Tari, Hatari, is probably the most, the biggest success we've had. So these are our three ringtail lemurs. So these came from Whipsnake several years ago. And much like the meerkats, it's a female dominated society, so these would be top of the tree. And lemurs are a really interesting evolutionary offshoot, so these are native to Madagascar. And they develop differently to other primates. So much like all the other primates and like ourselves, you'll see when they put their hands out, put your hand down, that they have thumbs just like us. And these thumbs are fantastic. You'll see when they're on the branches because it allows them to grip. So it's only us and primates that have thumbs. And this ability to grip and manipulate tools or food really has allowed them to develop into an evolutionary niche themselves. These come from the large grassland plains in Madagascar. And if you see their long tails, these are used as signaling. So when large groups of these animals, 30 or 40 strong, are walking through the grass, they'll often keep in contact by putting those long tails up in the air. So it allows all the members of the group to stay in touch. And those long tails as well are also used to um, establish dominance in the group as well. You'll often have Males that are coming to be trying a bit more dominant within the group, they have glands on the inside of their wrists, and they'll rub them up and down on their tail, and then flick that stink at other members of the group to really sort of mark their territory and show that they're the ones in charge. These animals are really endangered now in the wild. A lot of the natural forest in Madagascar is shrinking. So these animals, because they're confined to such a small geographical location, they're really struggling now. They're doing really well in zoos. So R3, again, are part of a managed breeding program. But the reason we have them here is hopefully people will see these beautiful animals at our zoo 
I'll read a bit about it on the signage, and they'll come to appreciate it and really care for them as much as we do. This group has been with us for quite a while now. As I said, it's a mum and two daughters. And the reason we don't breed them is that there's a lot in captivity already and their bloodline is really well represented. So these are really coming to retire here. But you'll see up here, they've also got similar to a thumb on their feet as well. So that not only allows them to grab on with their hands, but also their feet. These animals really, really gentle compared to other primate species. And you can see when they take food, uh, they'll do it relatively gently by holding onto your hand and then putting it in their mouth. Other primate species tend to be a lot rougher. But out of all the animals we are at the zoo, these are probably the ones we're most proud of because it was a real sign that we were becoming a zoo rather than an animal centre when they came in a few years ago. We really want to get the younger generation's idea of how we think we can get our conservation messages across. And in your normal years, we would often have about 2,000 school children coming to visit formal education sessions. This year has been slightly stranger due to COVID. In September, we're hoping to start remote education sessions from the zoo, whereby schools can learn a bit about the animals we have through Zoom. So the main focus, and it always has been at Hamwell Zoo, is that we're a massive part of the community. We wouldn't survive without it. So I can't say thank you enough to all the groups that come down here and help us out over the time. Uh, I hope you enjoyed seeing some of the behind the scenes stuff at Hamwell Zoo today. We've got lots more that we couldn't show you today. If you would like to come down and see it, that would be great. You're open 364 days a year, except for Christmas Day. It's the only day we're shut. It's always sunny down here, so please feel free to pop down and see us. We're open from 10 o'clock every day.